and we're back with another episode of Miss Carlton Teaches from a Distance. <laughs> okay, so today we are looking at the poem from John Keats. This is called When I Have Fears. Now, this is actually a sonnet, so we're going to make note of that over here. This is called an Elizabethan sonnet or a Shakespearean sonnet, which named because he was obviously its most famous user and created his own style of sonnet. There are other sonnets before him, but he created his own style. So that's what we're following here. Now, we're going to start off just reading it and talking about what it means, and then we'll pick it apart for what it actually is. Okay, so first things first, what you need to remember is every poet writes um, from their own point of view, from their own heart. And in order to understand the poem, you have to also understand where the poet's coming from, what the poet was living through when he was writing this. And what you need to remember is John Keats was a wonderful poet, but he was not a man who lived very long. Uh, he died at 25 years old from tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is not a, a disease that you die from quickly. It's very long um, and it's a long, it's suffering. I mean, long periods of suffering and he hemorrhaged blood in the lungs. I mean, it's ugly. It's a very long, painful, horrible death. Uh, so he was very much aware of the fact that he was dying. So the idea that he says, when I have fears that I may cease to be, he means cease to be alive. I mean, this is like the Hamlet to be or not to be, to be alive or to not, not to be alive. And that's what he's talking about. This whole poem is when I have fears that I may die. Um, I, I like to combine this with a bucket list. Um, if you're in my tech or a basic class, you probably know that we have on the back of your notes a bucket list. And we'll talk about things you want to do. You can do bucket lists for seasons, like a lot of moms like to do summer bucket lists with their, excuse me, with their kids. In this case, this is uh, altogether darker. This is what I want to do before I die. Because like I said, he knew he was dying. Okay, he says, when I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has emptied my teeming brain, I, I changed a little bit there to make it easier to, for us, before high piled books in character hold like rich farmers the full ripened grains. What he means here is, when I, I'm afraid I'm going to die, before I write everything in my brain, before I read in books what I want to read, okay, so the, the character is the writing, the letters, high piled books and letters, whole luck, rich farmers, full ripened, ripened grains. These grains feed you, okay? Farmers raise grains to feed you. What he's saying is these books and the letters feed his mind. So he's worried about when I die, before I write what I want to write and before I read what I want to read. Okay, so he goes to the next one. He says, when I behold upon the night's star, starred face, huge cloudy symbols of a high romance. And he's serious, symbols of romance, high stars, big, beautiful, starry night. And I feel that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. So he's, he's afraid he's going to die before he gets to see these stars and think about what's, you know, tracing their outlines with romance. And it's beautiful and he wants to see it all again. It's one of these moments, and it's a very dark, sad moment here, where you start looking around you and thinking about all the things you'll never get to do again. And that's that's what he's doing. In our third set, he says, when I feel, fair creature of an hour, and I love the, this timing. He says, when I feel, and then he stops, and he addresses this person. He says, fair creature of an hour. Now, what he means is woman. Okay, lady, pretty woman I'm with, basically. Fair meaning beautiful. Woman I'm here with. That I shall never look upon you more. I'm worried that I won't get to see you anymore. Never have relished in the fairy power of unreflecting love. Okay, I'm not going to be able to see you anymore. The love is not going to be there anymore. I'm going to die. I'm going to leave you here um, then he stops. Okay. This is always the case in these sonnets. In the sonnet, you start something here in these three sets of four lines. And then at the bottom, you end it. You solve your problem right down here. 
you have whatever you've started here, which he has started the what I'm not going to get to see anymore. And then he has to solve it down here in the last two lines. We have to bring it all together and tie it up with a nice little bow. He says of the wide world, or excuse me, I'm sorry. Then on the shore of the wide world, I stand alone and think now, as much as we like to think we're with people when they die, we always like to say, well, no, nobody wants to die alone. We like to say, you know, at least they weren't alone. But the truth is we all die alone. Okay. Because no, one, they're not dying with us. We're dying by ourselves. And that's what he's saying here. Then on the shore of the wide world, I stand alone because he's the one facing death and think. Now I changed a word here. He wrote nothingness. But for clarity and teaching, I just changed that to depths for the test questions. Because when we do the test, you're not going to be with me. So I needed I wanted that to be normal or be back to something we could do on our own. To love and fame, to nothingness to sink. Now, what he means here is depths, the depths of the ocean, the depths of the sea, way down in the dark where nobody sees it. So he's this is really um, it's a really good line here. He says, on the shore of the wide world, I'm standing here. Okay, I visualize a man standing on the shore. He says, then love and fame sink to the bottom because they no longer matter. Fame does not matter. And honestly, in this case, love doesn't matter in the end because he's about to die. It's very dark, very sad. But at the same time, I mean, he I don't know. I kind of want to think of it as hopeful because... He knows he's not going to really be alone, but maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just, um, oh, what's the word that where you, um, I'm having a brain fart, um, projecting. Yeah. Maybe he's just, maybe I'm just projecting my hopes, but he is, he knows that fame doesn't matter anymore in this world where he's about to die. Okay. So let's go back up now and we're going to look at some couple of things here. First thing we're going to do is turn this sideways because I want you to see here one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay. These are called quatrains. A quatrain, okay, Q U A T R, comes from the word quarter, okay, it is four, okay, four. That is how you make up a Shakespearean or Elizabethan sonnet. You have three of these. Okay, so that's 12 lines. And at the end, you have two by themselves. This is a couplet. Okay, it has two lines. So let's go back to straight again. Um, what I said earlier when I was saying the sets, quatrain number one talked about him, what he's not going to write, what he's not going to read. Quatrain number two talks about the lady he's not, or excuse me, the knight he's not going to be able to trace the stars anymore. Quatrain number three talks about this lady he's not going to get to see anymore. And lastly, this couplet talks about how all of this just kind of sinks into nothingness uh, when he thinks about facing death. Okay, so next we're going to talk about our rhymes. So let's look at the end of the lines. B, first rhyme, gets first letter, A. Brain, second rhyme, gets second letter, B. Character E rhymes with B, so it gets an A. Grains rhymes with brain, so it gets a B. Okay, A, B, A, B. Now, if this is truly a Shakespearean sonnet, it's going to do that again two more times. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. That's how a Shakespearean sonnet goes. It alternates rhymes, okay, in each of the quatrains, and then it will rhyme the same down here. So, face, trace, romance, chance, okay, our power, more, sure. So that rhymes, those fit. Think, sink. Mm -hmm. That is a Shakespearean sonnet. They always alternate, 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 the same at the very end. Now there is one more thing to talk about for a Shakespearean sonnet, and then you will be done picking it apart. And that is the syllables. How many in each line? We have 
we're going to count, okay? When I have fears that I may cease to be. Well, there's 10. Before my pen has emptied my teeming brain. Well, I said it wrong then. Before my pen has emptied my teeming brain. 10. Now this one, I'll explain. Before high piled books in character. Now, see, that's only nine. That's why, whoops, that's why this little guy is here. This tells me that piled needs to be pronounced with two syllables. Piled. Before high pile lead books in character. Now it's ten. That's the thing. We put little guys like this in there to make it longer. We can also take ones out to make them shorter. This, every line in here is going to be 10 because this is written in iambic pentameter. The rules are very strict on a Shakespearean or Elizabethan sonnet, or on all sonnets. You have to have ABAB, CDCD, EFEF, GG, okay? There's no moving around. It has to be that rhyme scheme. It has to be written in iambic pentameter which means you have to have 10 beats in every line. Now, the way you can tell if it's iambic pentameter is this. Goodbye. Goodbye is an example of two beats. Now, an iambic pentameter has this five times. The way you say the word, goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Bye is where you hit your hardest syllable. Goodbye. We don't say goodbye. You don't say it that way. So if you had this ten to, or five times to make 10 beats, that would be a iambic pentameter line. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. That's how the sound makes. When I have fears that I may cease to be. There you go. When I have fears that I may cease to be. Now, granted, we don't read it with that much an emphasis, but that's the flow. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. All right. That we said it had, we talked about its rhyme scheme. We talked about its meter. We also said it has to have four quatrains and then a little couplet at the end. And lastly, it has to have what's called a turn. It talks about here, we talk about what's going on, okay? And that he doesn't have quite as big of a turn as you would see in Shakespeare. In Shakespeare, he'll present the problem and then he'll like flip it and do something else down here and then he'll solve the problem at the very end. Um, Keats is doesn't doesn't exactly flip. He stays kind of on the same path the whole time, but he does at the end solve his problem in the last two, the the couplet at the end. Okay, that is. Oops, never mind. I will see you later for Ode on a Grecian Urn.